Okay, let me get my screen share up here. Uh, where is my screen share? Ah, yeah, I've lost it. Hmm. Okay. Oof. Scared me there for a second. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome back, folks. We are into the Civil War in the Ozarks. Uh, very important event. Uh, it was really uh, really involved. In, and the Civil War in the Ozarks isn't talked a lot about uh, outside of the Ozarks because, very frankly, uh, it's not very, uh, I hate to use the term sexy, but, you know, that's kind of what it is. You know, when you talk about battle, like the Battle of Gettysburg and, and some of these other really big, humongous battles, like the Battle of Manassas and um, some of these, the Ozarks just doesn't really resonate with the general public. And yet, it was such an important battle and such an important state to the Civil War. And so we're going to give it its due course here, and we're going to talk about it quite a bit. So. Um, well, hang on here. I'm, uh, for some reason, I'm back where we were last week and I don't want to be there. So hang on just a second here. I don't know where I have lost. Hmm. I'll get it fixed here in a minute. There we go. Whew. Got to be smarter than technology, folks. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to be talking about today is the war beginning in the, in Missouri and in this, the Civil War. So here is my the spotlighted Ozarker of the day. Now, I can guarantee you, everybody out there listening to me knows who this woman is. You just might not recognize her from that photograph, but there's not one person out here that hasn't heard of her and haven't watched her on TV a lot. And of course, I guess by this time, you're probably beginning to figure out it's half pine herself. This was Laura Ingalls Wilder. Now, of course, Laura Ingalls was not a homegrown Ozarker. She actually came to the Ozarks as a young married woman with her husband. Uh, and she actually, if you don't know this, she actually did not start writing her books until late in life. Uh, kind of, you know, uh, gives us all a little inspiration. I think she was actually in her late 50s or early 60s before she started writing her series of books, The Little House on the Prairie Books. In fact, um, it was her daughter who was by then a grown woman and uh, an author herself who actually prompted her mother to start writing the books. And so, uh, you know, a little inspiration out there. It's never too late. Some of you may have a book in you if you've not written one and maybe y'all just sit down and start writing a book. Um, and maybe you all will become as famous as Half Pint there. Okay, so let's kind of review. The 1850s, uh, the 10 years prior to the Civil War, we talked about this last week, but I just want to kind of review it real fast. There were at least five events that really uh, set the stage for the Civil War in 1861. The first one, of course, was the Compromise of 1850, and that's the compromise that brought California into the Union and kind of uh work with texas kind of uh working to uh pay off their debts and some of these things like this very important compromise uh for both sides 
Then there was the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, where uh, Stephen Douglas of Illinois tried to start a new kind of policy which would allow each state that come into the Union to determine whether they wanted to come in as a slave state or a free state. That concept was called popular sovereignty. Um, unfortunately, um, that didn't work out too well because the end result was a failure in the state of Kansas, the territory of Kansas, which caused it to erupt into a full-fledged border war with Missouri. In fact, the case, folks, the Civil War, we kind of had a mini Civil War for the first five years between Missouri and Kansas. Um, it was just open warfare. Uh, and that's where you had events um, like uh, the killings of Potawatomi by John Brown, and he went ahead and seized Harper's Ferry and all. And then, of course, you had the Dred Scott decision. That was a really, really important decision because that negated all the compromises of the past. And it kind of sent a signal to both sides that, you know, this isn't going to end in a good way. Uh, I can guarantee you both sides kind of uh, stiffened their spine in 1857 and both sides decided right then and there that the only way that this was going to end was going to be through violence. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And then, of course, we did have the raid on Harper's Ferry in, by John Brown in 1859, which absolutely scared the Southerners to death because this was an attempt to cause a nationwide slave insurrection, which was the biggest fear of Southern slave owners. I mean, they, they feared this more than anything else because they knew that the slaves were in such vast numbers that they could probably overwhelm them if they actually rose up. And John Brown's intent was to uh, cause such a huge slave insurrection and arm them that they would rise up and take over uh, the South. And it scared the slave owners to death. Uh, at that point, all they were waiting for was the election of 1860. So they could determine just exactly where this nation was going to go. And so the election of 1860 came about for the president. Now, there were four candidates for president. On the Republican side up there, you have Abraham Lincoln. The Republican Party was a brand new party. It had just been formed in the mid-1850s. The first candidate was John C. Fremont in 1856, the old pathfinder, uh, the old explorer. And he's going to play a part, by the way, in the Civil War here. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, he was, of course, an Illinois uh, congressman for a couple terms, and then he was defeated for the senatorial seat in 1858 by Stephen Douglas. Uh, his platform basically was that he did not think that slavery ought to be allowed in any of the territories. Now, I want you to understand something. Abraham Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He was not, at this point in time, campaigning to do away with slavery. In fact, the case he was very much, had been very much involved in the repatriation movement to send the slaves back to Africa. And uh, he, was, he was not an abolitionist. He did not feel at that point that that was the thing to do. Now, he moved to that. I'm, I want to make sure you understand, by the time 1862 came around, after a couple of years, he had moved into the abolitionist camp. He had no choice. He felt like he just had to. The Democrats, on the other hand, split themselves. First of all, you had Stephen Douglas here. He was the Northern Democrat. Now, his, uh, he was basically for popular sovereignty. He said, let's let every state territory decide for themselves how they want to enter into the Union. The problem is that didn't really satisfy anybody. We saw that in Kansas. Nobody really liked that idea at all. Um, and so as you're going to see, Stephen Douglas didn't receive a whole lot of presidential votes. Then there was John Beckenridge. I'm going to skip over here to the Southern Democrat. He split from the party. The Democratic Party was by far and away the pro-slavery party at this time. Um, the, the elements in the South, at least. 
And so they split from the Northern Democrats and held their own convention and nominated their own presidential candidate. And that was the vice president of the United States, a man by the name of John Breckinridge. He was from Kentucky, and he was definitely a pro-slavery candidate. He said, absolutely, the Constitution, uh, the Supreme Court has ruled, uh, the Constitution states that slavery is protected, and that's what we must do. Now, that was very popular in the southern states. It was anathema in the northern states, the abolitionist states. And then there was a kind of in-between candidate between the Democrats. Man that had once been a Democrat, but had gone off and uh, had kind of gone on his own. A man by the name of John Bell, who had been a former senator from Tennessee. And John Bell formed something called the Constitutional Unionist Party. And his platform was said, basically, the federal government should support slavery, but also defend the union. He said, I agree that slavery at this point in time is legal where it is, you know, where it is. But at the same time, I absolutely am against uh, having a secession and dissolving the United States. There were people that were ready to dissolve the United States as you will see here in just a minute. And so at this point, these four candidates are running for president. Now, normally, it would have been no contest. Normally, the Democrats would have won. That had been what had been happening for several terms here. But because the Northern and the Southern Democrats split, and because John Bell split off enough votes, that allowed Abraham Lincoln to come in to the Union as the president. And you can see here how it all played out. Uh, down here in the green states, that was Breckinridge. He absolutely took all the green states plus the state of Maryland and Delaware. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, on the other hand, took all the northern states plus Oregon and California. And then Bell took away what were called basically the border states, including Virginia. Uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, he was able to siphon those off. Those normally would have been all Democratic states, but instead he was able to siphon them off as a fourth party candidate for all practical purposes. Only Missouri voted for Stephen Douglas, rather ironic, uh, because we have been fighting this civil war with Kansas over popular sovereignty for four years. But we voted as a whole for Stephen Douglas. By the way, the Ozarks, the southwestern part of Missouri, voted overwhelmingly for John Bell, the Constitutional Union Party. We voted to maintain slavery, but also maintain the union. So this is how it all played out in 1860. Abraham Lincoln is elected president. And the South immediately goes ballistic. So, well, unfortunately, the better angels of our nature did not come about. And instead, we, of course, erupted into civil war. Uh, South Carolina, in reaction to Lincoln's election, had already left the Union and then taken with them uh, seven other Southern states, uh, the states of Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. And then, of course, later on, they were joined by several other states. Uh, <clears throat> Virginia joined, and uh, North Carolina joined. And then there were four states that traditionally were called southern or border states, uh, the states of Kentucky and uh, Maryland and Delaware, uh, and I can't even remember the fourth one right now, uh, went on ahead and, and while they were slave states, did not secede from the Union as such. Now, where did Missouri go? Well, here is the problem. Missouri is extremely important to both sides. Again, you might not hear this very often, but just think about this. Think about, first of all, the location of Missouri. We controlled the Mississippi. All three of those were either on the border 
or in Missouri. So we had an extremely important uh, strategic location. On top of that, we had a huge source of manpower. We were the eighth most populous state in the union, folks. At this day and time, there were only seven other states larger than Missouri in population. So whoever got Missouri was going to get a great source of manpower to fight on their side. We also had a very valuable natural resources. No, we didn't have gold and silver, and we didn't have all these other things that we think about. What we had was lead. Now, you might say lead. Lead was an extreme important resource in these days because lead of course was what they used to make the bullets out of and we produced a great amount of the lead most people don't realize we still produce like 90 percent of the lead in the united states of america in in missouri it's an extremely important lead producing state uh one of the largest companies in missouri is a lead plaque company in joplin and uh they're very valuable in terms of all the new battery situations that are going on with electric cars and all. And then, of course, there's a psychological factor. If the South could convince Missouri to secede, it would be like a thumb sticking up. Uh, because Missouri, remember, the traditional southern border was the southern border of Missouri. And so anything north of that was traditionally abolitionist. Everything south of it was traditionally slave. Only Missouri was sticking up like a sore thumb. And so if you could get Missouri to secede, that would be an extremely important thing. And finally, there was a great interest in securing the Cherokee population of Missouri, because again, the Cherokees were noted fighters. And I think everybody, even at this stage of the game, realized that traditional warfare might not last as long as guerrilla warfare. And they knew that the Cherokee population would be really terrific fighters in this type of war, which indeed they turned out to be. As it turned out, the Cherokee nation basically split between the North and the South. One faction went North, one faction went South. So the war finally begins April, Fort Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, Lincoln had pledged, he said, you will, I will protect all federal property. And one of the biggest forts and one of the most important forts in the South was located in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. And this was Fort Sumter. And he said, under no circumstances will I allow the South to take this over. And sure enough, the South began to bombard it. He, uh, you know, he protected it as much as, as long as he could. And they finally did have to surrender. Once the Fort at Fort Sumter was seized by the Southern Confederate States. The war was on. Uh, they really had no choice at this point. Now, the question becomes here now is what is Missouri going to do? Now, remember, Missouri is kind of got a complex situation going on. Most people in Missouri are not slave owners, but by far and away, the population of Missouri favored slavery. On the other hand, by far and away, the population of Missouri did not sympathize with secession. So Missouri had a very difficult decision to make. Uh, most people in Missouri did not want to leave the Union. They thought that was not the thing to do, even though they felt like it was right that slave owners get to keep their slaves. Now, that was compounded by the fact that in St. Louis, particularly, you had a huge Scotch-Irish and German population, which were very much anti-slavery, as well as the Ozarks. And again, this, this kind of goes against what we think. You would think that the Ozarks, being in the southern part of the state, would be the hotbed of southern sympathizers. It was not. The Ozarks uh, were actually very much pro-union. Yes, they believed that people all have a right to keep their slaves, but they absolutely were not against leaving the union because the Scotch-Irish population made up a large percentage of the population in the Ozarks. And the Scotch-Irish were very much against secession. They had come to America to be Americans. 
And they did not, they did not feel like it was the right thing to do. Over 60% of the adult males in the state of Missouri would end up fighting in the Civil War. Uh, huge percentage. I'm not for sure, other than Virginia, that there was any state that contributed a larger share of the adult male population to fighting in the Civil War. I know in my family, uh, on the Union side, uh, my great-grandfather, Jacob, and two of his brothers and three of his cousins, six young men from Christian County, Missouri, around Ozark and Nixa, joined up and fought on the Union side. Uh, I mean, all, virtually all the males in the family that could fight, that were of fighting age, fought in, in the Civil War. It was just that kind of war. Uh, look at this. Missouri contributed in the long run 109,000 Union troops troops and 30,000 Confederate troops. That's a huge number, folks. That's a gigantic number. Look at Arkansas. Now, admittedly, Arkansas wasn't as populated as Missouri, but they only contributed 46,000 Confederate troops and 6,000 Union troops. They contributed no more than about a third of what uh, Missouri did. In fact, the case, there were over 1,100 military skirmishes. Now, not full-fledged battles. There were not a whole lot of big battles in Missouri. Missouri was primarily a, a, a guerrilla warfare battleground, which we're going to talk about quite extensively. Uh, but only Virginia had more military engagements than the state of Missouri. Most people, again, don't realize this. Uh, Missouri was an extremely important state. This is kind of a map that shows you the major battles and again, there were not that many major battles. Uh, in fact, really, there's only a couple of really what we would call major battles in Missouri. Of course, the first one and the most important was the, was the Battle of Wilson's Creek, which happened to be the second battle of the Civil War, major battle of the Civil War. Uh, right down here, just basically two to three miles from where I sit. Uh, there were other battles, the Battle of Carthage, we've already talked or talked about, uh, we'll talk about here in a minute, Newtonia. Newtonia, I think there were nine battles in Newtonia. Uh, there were some other battles, Pilot Knob, uh, Camp Jackson, Boonville, the Battle of Boonville was a pretty good sized battle. The Battle of Lexington was a pretty good sized battle. And the final battle was the Battle of Westport in 1846, 1864, pardon me. <clears throat> So that kind of gives you an idea of the important battles and skirmishes in the Missouri. By far and away, most of the, of the battle, most of the war in Missouri was fought in this part down here, and it was a guerrilla warfare. Uh, it was just brother against brother and neighbor against neighbor. And we're going to talk about this for quite a bit. So what did Missouri decide to do? Well, we had also elected, and it's and besides electing a new president, we had elected a governor in Missouri in 1860, a man by the name of Claiborne Fox Jackson, who was a secessionist. Now, he didn't bother to tell anybody that. You know, when he was running for governor, he didn't bother to tell everybody in the state, hey, I'm for secession, because he probably wouldn't have been elected, because people remember in Missouri did not want secession. So, but he secretly was a secessionist. There's no doubt about that. We know now from his writings and from people in history that he absolutely made it clear to those around him that he was going to bring Missouri out of the Union and take it into the Confederacy. The Missouri legislature, on the other hand, was very much anti-secession. So again, Missouri's confused here. You know, they didn't know exactly what they wanted to be. In the spring of 1861, Jackson called a state convention. He was going to try to convince the state legislature to secede from the Union. When he tried that, they absolutely rejected him. In fact, in case it was almost unanimous vote of the Missouri state legislature to stay within Union. So Jackson said, aha, uh -huh, what am I going to do now? Well, he decided to contrive a crisis. You know, there's no thing in politics. Uh, never let a crisis go to waste. Sometimes crises are done on purpose. 
I hate to tell you that if you don't believe that, but I, I actually believe that crises, some political crises are sometimes committed with the purpose of, of actually, you know, getting some kind of political advantage. Sure enough, this is what Jackson did. Uh, the next thing that happens, Lincoln asked for Missouri to provide troops and Jackson sends him an insulting letter. And he says, there's no way Missouri is going to send one soldier to fight the Civil War on the side of the Union. We will never send any soldiers to fight the Civil War. Now, he kind of controlled the media, uh, the militia. So, you know, he kind of controlled this in a way. So the next thing he decides to do after sending this insulting letter, he decides to create a crisis. And he orders a small U.S. arsenal at Liberty, Missouri, just east of Kansas City, to be seized by the state militia. So he orders the state militia to seize the, the federal arsenal. Now, that's an act of war. But to the credit of Lincoln and the federal authorities, they just kind of ignored it because they thought, nah, you yeah, know, we're talking about a few hundred guns. We're not talking about anything that important. Let's not overreact. And so they basically just ignored it. Well, that irritated Jackson. He said, well, I got to do something more than that then. So then he, he orders the state militia to go to St. Louis to seize the arsenal at St. Louis. Now, folks, we're talking big time. The arsenal at, at uh, St. Louis is gigantic. Uh, it is really, really big. It's one of the largest in the South, and it has a whole lot of weapons. Now you've got to have something done. Well, realizing this is about to take place, he sees the militia coming. He sees them surrounding, or Frank Blair does. Frank Blair is a congressman from St. Louis. He's a fanatic abolitionist and a huge Union sympathizer and a huge supporter of Lincoln. Well. He gets a hold of Lincoln and he says, Abe, you got to do something here. They're going to seize the arsenal at St. Louis. And that's going to create a real problem here for you. And so Lincoln, realizing that he needed to take action, uh, requests that General Nathaniel Lyon from Fort Riley, Kansas, who had been out there taking care of bleeding Kansas, he orders uh, General Lyon from Kansas to come over to seize the arsenal and protect it from seizure from the state militia. This is Frank Blair, the congressman, the abolitionist congressman from Missouri that is requesting that Lincoln do this. So who was Gen General Nathaniel Lyon? Of course, Lyon later on becomes a general that fights the Battle of Wilson's Creek for the Union side. And he is killed, by the way, the Battle of Wilson's Creek. He is the first general the first Union general killed in battle in the Civil War. So General Lyon comes to St. Louis with his army. Now, General Lyon probably was the wrong man, okay? Uh, he, was, he was a good guy, and he was loyal and all, but he was a little bit irrational. In fact, the case, uh, one of his best friends said he was kind of crazy. OK, if that tells you anything, I'm going to read you a quote about him here in a minute. Uh, his first act was to secretly transfer the large munitions of the St. Louis Arsenal across the river to Alton, Illinois. The first thing he did was in the middle of the night, load all the guns and all the weapons in the arsenal at St. Louis and transport them across the Mississippi River to Alton, Illinois, uh, about 40 miles north of St. Louis. And, uh, of course, that was a much more strategically secure place. And it was also a place where basically the, the Southerners could not get to it. So he did the right thing, okay? But then it got out of hand. Uh, he decided that he was going to meet with uh, Governor Jackson and the head of the Missouri State Militia, a man by the name of General Sterling Price, who what had been a former governor of Missouri. So he called a meeting. He said, Blair, let's me and you meet with these two guys and see if we can reach a settlement. Let's see if we can appease them. Now, trust me, folks, 
I don't think General Lyon had any desire to appease Jackson and Price, just like Jackson had no desire to appease Frank Blair and Nathaniel Lyon. When they met, it was absolute open warfare between the four. In fact, the case, when it was done, when Jackson said, we will never send any troops to fight for the Union, Lyon looked him in the eye, and this is a quote. He said, I would rather see every man, woman, and child dead in Missouri before allowing you to secede. He basically told the governor of the state, I'll kill everybody in the state before I let the state secede. Now, you can only imagine the reaction of Jackson and Price. They went back to the state, to the state legislature. Uh, they told them what happened, and the state legislature was just aghast. They thought, surely he doesn't mean that. Well, the next thing that happens is this. By the way, here's a description of Lyon. This is from Dr. Hammond, one of his best friends and his personal physician that traveled with him. He later on described Lyon as intolerant of opposition, prone to inject the most unpopular opinions, easily aroused to anger that was almost insane, narrow-minded, mentally unbalanced, but also honest to the core, truthful, intelligent, generous to a fault and absolutely more or you talk about a split personality there <laughs> you know you can see that this was like throwing gasoline on a fire when you inserted lion into this situation it was just more on that's all there was to it and sure enough that's what happened lion immediately takes action he seizes the missouri state militia the ones that are guarding Camp Jackson, they don't know that they have moved all the weapons. They think the weapons are still there. They were unaware that this had happened. Lyon seizes that part of the state militia, which is surround the arsenal. He takes them prisoner, and then he does a really stupid thing. He marches them down the streets of St. Louis. Now, true, St. Louis was pro-Union and had a huge German population, but folks, Nobody wanted to see this. The Missourians, even the pro-Union people, were aghast that he would do this. You can imagine what happened. Uh, hostilities broke out. People started throwing things at them. Supposedly, somebody fired a shot into the Lion's army. The result was that Lion ordered his troops to shoot into the crowd, killing 28 civilians. It was just absolutely the worst thing that could have happened for the state of Missouri. This absolutely galvanized the legislature into passing an act of secession. So at this point, Missouri, at least technically, secedes from the Union. But Lyons already said, it's not going to happen, folks. And so he immediately turns his army towards Jefferson City and begins marching to Jefferson City with the intent to arrest the whole Missouri state legislature. He said, I'm going to arrest them all. Bring them in. You know, they're not going to do this. Uh, June 14th, he reaches Boonville, uh, meets a small militia force, defeats them. And then uh, he goes ahead and seizes uh, Jefferson City. By this time, the Missouri State Legislature and the governor and the majority of the state militia have fled to the southwestern part of the state. Now, 315, so I'm going to need to stop here. And next week, we're going to talk about the events right before uh, the actual battle on August 10th of 1861. So we're going to talk about the next events that occur within the next month or so that precede the Battle of Wilson's Creek in 1861. So that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And, uh, you know, we will talk about the Battle of Carthage next week, and we'll talk about how Missouri, how uh, Lyon and General McCullough and Price and Pierce all met up uh, and got ready to fight the Battle of Wilson Street. So I thank you for being with us. I hope you had a good time and learned something and enjoy the weather. It's absolutely gorgeous here, and the trees are turning, and it's going to be a beautiful fall in the Ozarks. I can just feel it. So. We'll see you next week.